What happens when a super hyped game, especially one that's good at launch, faces immense backlash? What happens when fear of disappointment turns to anger and eventually hate? Let's take a look at 10 such games here. Star Wars Battlefront 2 DICE's first Star Wars Battlefront wasn't awful, but it was a far cry from what made the original game so endearing. Even on its own, the amount of content and features just felt lackluster. So when Star Wars Battlefront 2 was announced, it seemed like Electronic Arts was ticking all of the boxes. More extensive maps and modes, a single-player campaign, free post-launch updates, it all seemed like a dream come true for Star Wars fans. Then, Star Cards happened. Star Cards were equipable items that provided significant boosts to one's combat abilities. And of course, the best way to get them was through RNG loot boxes. It was like the pay-to-win pot had finally boiled over. That too, in a franchise that was popular among kids. The fact that it costs so much to unlock Star Wars heroes and villains for use in multiplayer, leading to the infamous pride and accomplishment comment from EA on Reddit, didn't help things either. To say the backlash was immense would be an understatement. Star cards were pulled from purchase and moved to class level unlocks. Microtransactions were now limited to cosmetics. More multiplayer content, both online and offline, was introduced and numerous fixes were deployed. It was quite the turnaround for the malign title. By the time support began winding down in 2020, fans began a petition for more DLC, even willing to pay for the same. That didn't happen, but at least Battlefront 2's life cycle ended on a happy note. Warcraft 3 Reforged Which is more than anyone could say for Warcraft 3 Reforged, from the outset, it sounds like an amazing idea. Warcraft 3 Reign of Chaos is one of the most beloved real-time strategy games of all time. One of its custom maps, Dota, would even become a huge sensation and lead to the creation of Dota 2 by Valve, igniting popularity in the MOBA genre for years to come. So the fact that Blizzard was remastering it with gorgeous new visuals and cutscenes sounded amazing. There weren't a lot of details, especially leading up to the release, but it's Warcraft 3. How do you mess up Warcraft 3? As it turns out, quite easily. The opening was the only remade cinematic. Everything else was simply remastered, and it didn't help that screenshots for these were left on the game's official store listing, essentially misleading players. Technical problems and bugs, broken matchmaking, lag, desyncs and disconnects, iffy looking visuals, changes to the original's UI, no profiles or win-loss records, no automated tournaments, ladder play, or land mode, and if all of that wasn't bad enough, Blizzard declared that it owned all user-created content, pretty much killing any hope for the custom map scene. But that's not the worst part. The worst part is that all of these changes were applied to the original Warcraft 3 as well. So you couldn't just go back to the old game. You were forced to download the 30 gigabyte patch and essentially have a worse version of a beloved game. Eventually, reports emerged of how much Activision limited the budget of the classic games team with layoffs in February 2019 not helping either. It also opted to release the game early, because why not? The Classic Games team would be disbanded several months after launch, leaving other teams to fix the game. Despite launching in January 2022, Warcraft 3 Reforged only recently received ranked play, player profiles, and leaderboards in its latest PTR patch. Wolfenstein Youngblood Rumors of a new Wolfenstein were circulating for a while before the announcement of Youngblood, and even though it focused on BJ Blazkowicz's daughters instead of the beloved Nazi Slayer himself, it could have offered a unique story experience. If nothing else, one could look forward to the incredible gunplay that's defined the new series for a while. The bad news is that it didn't. Enemies were bullet sponges, and while weak to certain types of ammo, could still soak up a lot of damage, and ammo wasn't exactly plentiful. Playing offline with the AI was an exercise in torture. The levels were connected by a large open hub, which kind of worked in Wolfenstein 2009, but utterly flopped here. Jesse and Sophia were also extremely irritating as characters, and it all felt like one big excuse to push for co-op and microtransactions. Long story short, you wouldn't think that a bad game could come out of Arcane Studios and Machine Games, with Deathloop creative director Dinga Bakaba co-directing. But Wolfenstein Youngblood proved everyone wrong, and then some. Destiny In terms of hyped and overhyped games in the past decade, Bungie's Destiny ranks up there. 
All of the ingredients were there. The studio's first new IP in years and years, a 10-year deal with Activision where the latter reportedly paid $500 million, even star talent like Peter Dinklage and Nathan Fillion signed on for its cast. Throughout all of this, and even after the first co-op gameplay showing, many wondered just what Destiny was. The first beta offered a better look at co-op activities, loot, PvP, the social hub, and much more. It was almost like Borderlands, but not quite. Some concerns popped up about the amount of content, especially since players reached the moon fairly quickly after Earth. But surely, there would be more in the full release. Cut to the full release. Destiny was a major success, becoming the biggest new IP in history. Server troubles, connection issues, and so on plagued the game due to the massive influx of players. But this was it. Bungie was back, right? Unfortunately, as players spent more time with the game, it became clear just how hollow Destiny was. The story was a mess, with laughable writing, and once it was finished, players were left with little to do besides patrols, strikes, and PvP on the limited number of maps. Rewards felt incredibly stingy. Your Crucible and Vanguard marks were capped each week, limiting the legendary loot that could be acquired. Legendary drops felt terrible, especially in the old days when purple engrams could decrypt into rare items, which was quickly fixed. These were but a few issues on top of repetitive missions, wonky PvP balance, and bugs. The Vault of Glass raid arrived and was rightfully praised, but brutal RNG and artificial difficulty due to light levels reared their head again. Bungie would add slivers of new content over the next several months, with the Dark Below being horrendous. House of Wolves was better received. Reports emerged about how the project was effectively rebooted several months out from launch, which explained the last delay and major story sections were effectively ripped out and retooled. Nevertheless, it was a success, and the Taken King would arrive a year later to smooth things over. Of course, Bungie would repeat this entire mess all over again with Destiny 2, but that's another story altogether. Gran Turismo 7 Franchises like Forza and Need for Speed generate a good amount of hype with new game announcements, but there's no denying the hype around Gran Turismo. Though Gran Turismo Sport launched in 2017, the last numbered entry was Gran Turismo 6 in 2013. To say that there was a ton of hype for Gran Turismo 7 would be an understatement. There was also plenty to be hyped about. GT Simulation Mode was returning, along with dynamic time and weather effects, driving school, GT Auto, and more. New features like menu books promise fun ways to unlock cars while learning about the history of different manufacturers. Even after the delay, Gran Turismo 7 was showered with praise upon release for its gameplay, visuals, sound design, and presentation. As usually happens though, the real discoveries were made only after launch. Career mode turned out to be a lot shorter than fans were expecting, and once the menu books were completed, there wasn't a whole lot left to do. You could race through the same lucrative tracks to earn credits for the most expensive cars. Or you could spend real money on in-game currency with microtransactions conveniently switched on after reviews dropped. Polyphony Digital then lowered payouts for the most rewarding tracks, significantly increasing the grind for legendary cars. Then, servers went down, rendering a good chunk of the game inaccessible, since it was always online. This was more than enough time for the title to be review-bombed on Metacritic, becoming the lowest user-rated Sony-published title in the site's history. The developer eventually acknowledged the backlash, though it didn't quite backtrack. It vowed to add more content and means of earning credits in-game instead of repeating the same events. Soon enough, new cars, scapes, circuit race events, endurance race missions, and increased payouts for certain races arrived. Everything seemed to be going just fine, until an update in late May increased the price of legendary cars, because of course it did. Battlefield 2042 Even before DICE announced it was working on the next Battlefield, Rumors circulated about it for a while. The return to a more modern setting and very large maps were just a few things mentioned, and when the developer confirmed other studios like Criterion were helping to make it the biggest Battlefield game yet, the excitement was palpable. Finally, Battlefield 2042 was unveiled last summer and made an impact with its trailer full of callbacks to classic community shenanigans. Wingsuits, destructible environments, weather phenomena like massive tornadoes running through maps, 128 player matches, it seemed like a dream come true for Battlefield fans. The fact that there was no campaign, 
and a $70 price tag on current gen consoles, which of course enjoyed all the new features, only slightly dulled enthusiasm. Battlefield Portal was also eventually revealed, showcasing older Battlefield content which players could partake in with various custom rule sets and match variants. However, excitement turned to concern when the game missed its first open beta date. It was slated to begin in early September, then rumored for later that month, and finally confirmed for October, after the full game was delayed to November. Things seemed a little dicey, but surely more time for polish couldn't be a bad thing. Once fans tried the beta though, it was obvious that the sheer number of design, performance, and technical issues couldn't just be fixed in a matter of weeks. And once again, as much as many wanted to believe the full game would be better, Battlefield 2042 launched in a miserable state. Enough has been said about the sheer range of missing features from previous games, the terrible gunplay, horrendous map design, weapon, and vehicle balance, and so on. The game still sits at 28% mostly negative score on Steam based on over 108,000 user reviews. DICE has spent significant time and effort to improve on it, revamping the scoreboard and rebalancing weapons, and officially dropping support for the Tarkov-esque Hazard Zone. And while new content is on the way, there's no shaking the feeling that EA will dip on the title once it fulfills current Year 1 obligations, especially with rumors of the next Battlefield already being in the works. Crackdown 3 Crackdown 3 was first announced in 2014. It was eventually released in 2019 after multiple delays and leadership changes. Cloudgen, being the principal developer before Sumo Digital was eventually revealed to be in charge, and so on. Did we mention numerous other studios that helped on the title, like Regent Games, Double Eleven, Climax Studios, Ruffian Games, and Certain Affinity? All of this just to deliver a campaign mode with visuals from the Xbox 360 era to match an outdated gameplay loop of complete activities and then go kill the boss. It was so completely thrown together that one could assume the campaign was developed in a handful of months. But perhaps the biggest issue was the promise of cloud-based destruction. Way back in 2014, Phil Spencer talked about utilizing the power of the cloud for a fully destructible city. It sounded unbelievable, which turned out to be completely accurate. Eventually, this was shifted to Wrecking Zone, a multiplayer mode where almost the entire map could be destroyed. The player base quickly died for the same because it was little more than a gimmick without any actual gameplay hooks. Some could probably appreciate Crackdown 3 for its old-school throwback approach, but considering it to be a good game with all of the years of development and hype was a stretch for many. Ghost Recon Breakpoint When Ghost Recon Wildlands was first showcased, right up to its first beta and eventual release, there was plenty of skepticism. The series had always been known for its linear, stealth-oriented gameplay, squad play, and realism. Now all of a sudden, it was turned into yet another open-world sandbox. The fact that it was teeming with bugs, glitches, and other issues up to launch didn't help. But eventually, fans embraced it for what it offered. Playing on higher difficulties with friends allowed for somewhat replicating the brutal stealth of the older games, and the sheer amount of stuff you could do was also nice. Subsequent updates that added Ghost Mode, Tier 1 Mode, and various crossovers with Splinter Cell and Rainbow Six Siege also helped. Ghost Recon Wildlands, for all of its initial faults, was actually a fun co-op shooter. When Ghost Recon Breakpoint was first revealed, it appeared to be following in those footsteps but leaning more into survival mechanics. Then, the developer confirmed that there would be rarities for guns. Also, no AI teammates. You were completely solo this time. The beta was limited, and because it was a beta, one assumed the full game would fix the various issues. Unfortunately, Breakpoint was broken in multiple ways at launch, from numerous bugs and server issues to problematic performance. Design-wise, it was a huge step back, presenting a terrible story with a throwaway antagonist, numerous drones to fight which acted as little more than bullet sponges, a social hub and copious amounts of microtransactions. And of course, the aforementioned loot system, which was kinda moot since you could one-shot headshot human enemies. Such was the disappointing sales for Breakpoint that they actually contributed to a two-year low for Ubisoft stock while causing several other games to be delayed for the sake of polish. It would receive numerous updates and improvements, including the return of AI teammates, but it was still considered a massive step down from its predecessor, Fallout 76. The hype around Fallout 76 was 
complicated, to say the least. It started well enough with a 24-hour stream that culminated in its reveal, teasing the new Vault 76. And while director Todd Howard touted 16 times the detail and 4 times the map size of Fallout 4, expectations became fairly deflated when it was revealed to be an online title. That too, an online survival title with crafting. Bethesda did its best to assuage concerns, noting that it's not like Rust or anything. Unfortunately, impressions didn't improve in the following months. The closed beta arrived and had several issues. From its absurd download size, which had a habit of deleting itself at random, presumably to spare people, to countless bugs. There was still hope among some players, despite launching a few weeks before the full game. This was just a beta, and most issues would be resolved, hopefully. Fast forward to launch, and wouldn't you know it, but Fallout 76 was an utter mess. Crashes, server issues, bugs, performance issues, and that's not taking into account the horrible combat, lackluster storytelling, lack of human NPCs, insulting PvP, lack of decision making that defined Fallout, and so on. It was almost like the series had come full circle and became a parody of itself. It would take a good few years and numerous big content updates before Fallout 76 was deemed somewhat acceptable. Not great, but at least playable. With reports of excessive crunch and Q&A that slowly went insane after crucial bugs were ignored by management, it's enough to make one concern about the future of Starfield. Anthem The number of ways that Anthem's release pretty much mirrored Fallout 76 is almost insane especially since it was released just a few months later. Before launch, you had all of the AAA cliches, Bioware revealing gameplay that looked way too good to seem real-time, and was later confirmed to be complete smoke and mirrors. A troubling development cycle stretching years and years with numerous people leaving. A sparse amount of details leading up to launch, coupled with delays and reports of crunch. Memes about Bioware magic and how the developer believed everything could come together at the last minute in development. Proven horribly, horribly wrong. But the most hilarious part was, once again, the beta that was released just a month or so before launch. Once again, we all thought that many of its core issues would be fixed. And hey, the Iron Man-like flying was fun, at least. Lo and behold, the actual game was far worse. Combat was a catastrophe. Loot drops in the non-existent endgame were stingy as heck. Bugs were everywhere, accompanied by horrible performance. Heading out into the open world required menus upon menus, and so on. The game itself was also broken up strangely. You had a single-player hub explored in first person with awkward cutscenes, while the actual combat was in third person and in a completely separate open space that was as barren as it was visually lush. Bioware's reputation was already on thin ice following Mass Effect Andromeda, but Anthem was pretty much its death nail. The backlash didn't stop with the horrible launch either, as despite delivering numerous updates, the developer failed to live up to its roadmap, delaying and eventually cancelling several promised features like guilds, leaderboards, expanded progression, and so on. An internal Anthem Next was planned, but ultimately cancelled before it even got off the ground. That's all for now. If you enjoy what you saw, please hit the like button. And if you're new to the channel, now is a great time to subscribe. We upload brand new videos every single day. After subscribing, don't forget to enable all notifications by clicking the bell icon. Thanks for watching this video, and we'll see you next time, right here on Gaming Bolt.